Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Flint Corona, excuse me, and welcome to the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. I was looking at 96 weeks and got a little sidetracked, sidetracked, Sherelle. It's been 96 weeks that we have been talking with our community about coronavirus. And one of the really important reasons that we established this in the, for the HFRCC partnership was to bring a local context to a global pandemic. So today we're excited that the Health Flint Research Coordinating Center, along with the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions and the Michigan Prevention Research Centers continues to support this very, very important educational opportunity. And let me again say, as we start off, how much we appreciate those of you in community who come to be with us every week and provide questions and insights for us so we can continue this work. It is my sheer delight to be your moderator today, Yvonne Lewis, as a co-director of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. Uh, the work that goes on to make sure that we can do this is a, is a sheer partnership. And I, I'm really on sheer today, but it is an important partnership. And you, we've talked to you about the number of partners that join us every week to be a part of the webinar. I wanna thank those partners and let you know that even today, our partners are on the line, Jim Melanowski from the Genesee Health Plan. Uh, we have Joanne Herman from the Genesee County Health Department, Katie Baxter from, the, from Genesee Health Systems, Dr. Lawrence Reynolds, who wears a couple of hats. He is a chief advisor to the mayor, uh, public health advisor to the mayor, but he is also a pediatrician. We also have Sherelle from the Genesee County Health Department, Dr. Susan Wolford from Mich University of Michigan at Flint, excuse me, University of Michigan in Iron Arbor, and Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Deborah for Holden is here with us today. And then we also have Nurse T, we found affectionately call her Nurse T, Tarnisha Martin from Hurley Medical Center. And the list goes on. You can see all these partners, but those I listed are available today in as a panelist to answer any questions that you might have. And we do have some questions that we're gonna work to answer for you today. Our conversation today will include the COVID surge. All of us have heard that we, now are in a situation almost similar, if not even more challenging than when we first started this webinar 96 weeks ago. Uh, we're gonna talk about signs and symptoms of COVID because of some of the changes in the virus itself. Some of the signs and symptoms are not quite the same. We wanna do a, a really in-depth conversation today about our health equity brief. We will have updates from the Genesee County Health Department and the City of Flint. So thank you so much. I see Lottie Ferguson from the City of Flint has joined us. So if you have those questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna ask our panelists to please join me this, this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Reynolds, Tarnisa Martin, Dr. Susan Wolford, Dr. Deborah Forholden, uh, Jim Melanowski from the Health Plan. And Katie, I'm gonna ask you too, because there was a question, if you could join us in the, in the round table as well. But I wanna start off with Jim Melanowski because Jim, at the, as the CEO of the Genesee Health Plan, there have been questions about healthcare coverage. And we know we've talked for the last few months about um, this open enrollment period. So can you bring us up to speed on where we are and if individuals need assistance, who do they reach out to? Jim. Sure. Thank you, Yvonne. Yeah, it, the deadline is nearing. It's actually tomorrow. So, um, but staff here at the health plan is still available. You can call us 810-232-7740. There's other partners that are available today as well. Um, but so, yes, there is still time for people to sign up uh, or re-enroll if they, if they want a new health plan on the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Also, life happens. And so if, even if you miss today's deadline, there are qualifying changes that you can go on and enroll at any time. For instance, if you lose your job, change in income. So, you know, maybe you take another job that's less pay or you lose one. You lose your health care coverage, changes in residency, so you move from one, uh, maybe one county to another, or changes in your marital status, uh, you know, you got married, got divorced, you were on your spouse's insurance, now you aren't. Those are all what we call qualifying events that even though this open enrollment period is over, you can get on any time or ask Genesee Health Plan for assistance in, 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 in getting health care coverage. Big, big message is that 
no one in our community, whether they're children or adults, should not, should ha not have health care coverage of one sort or another. And that's what makes us really special here in Genesee County. We have the Genesee Health Plan. So even during outside of these times of open enrollment, we can at least get people on the Genesee Health Plan, get them to see a doctor, get them covered for services. And, and then, uh, you know, until they can get either employer coverage or other coverages. So, I, I, you know, there is a deadline tomorrow, but don't panic. We are here to assist even on uh, Sunday or Monday, you know, uh, moving forward. Thank you so much, Jim, for that. And that kind of leads us to a conversation we want to have with Nurse T. Because in the COVID surge, we see an increase in hospitalizations. Can you give us a sense of what's happening in early and some of the things you'd like us to think about? Nurse T, you're talking amazingly, wonderfully well there. We can't hear you. All right. Gotcha. I just unmute it. One thing I would like the community to really um, think about is the severity of the um, virus. Think about um, not hesitating about coming to the emergency room or any urgent care facility. Although, our emergency room is full. Um, we are in double digits. Our ER waits are longer than normal and expected, um, but we are doing everything we can to ensure that we are effectively caring for our patients. Um, the suspicion is that the Omicron virus is, is rampant. Um, and a lot of our patients may be experiencing that, but we know that is really hard to determine that. Um, we are discharging patients. Uh, within the last week, we did discharge over 171 patients. So that is some good news to the community. But if I can emphasize anything, we are busy. All of the um, ERs across, you know, within our community are staying full. They're in the double digits. Um, the community is coming in um, and they're waiting. If they, as soon as they have any signs or symptoms of fatigue, shorter, shortness of breath, they are not feeling well, to not ignore them symptoms and just to be proactive and just to make sure that they come to the medical center and don't let the long waits discourage them from waiting to receive care. Thank you, Nurse T. And you kind of jumped right into something that's near and dear to Dr. Deborah for holding heart. And we've talked about this, the signs and symptoms as well as the long waits in the at the medical centers. Dr. Ferholden, we talked about this. There's something that's happened over the course of this 96 weeks. And, and we started off talking about signs and symptoms, but things are different now. Can you help us to understand now what's going on with signs and symptoms today and why there's some distinctions? Yeah, the reason that I bring it up is because, you know, with all these new recommendations coming out and telling people if they don't have symptoms, they can do this or, I thought, well, a lot of times people don't even recognize their symptoms necessarily as COVID symptoms. So I just wanted to kind of review. If, if you think back to when the when this pandemic first hit the U.S., we weren't talking about loss of taste and smell. That was not one of the things that we talked about. You know, we were talking about fever. So remember, we were taking everybody's temperature, you know, and all of that. And now a lot of people have COVID and don't get a fever. When I had COVID, I never had a a fever. My first symptoms were uh, just a little itch in my throat. And within 24, 48 hours, it went to kind of like a sore throat. Um, and then I noticed that I would get fatigue if I exerted myself. I was standing up washing the dishes, something I normally do without problem. And I got really, really tired. And I had a terrible headache. And I don't normally get headaches. And so I had this terrible headache. And I even myself was like, are these COVID symptoms? So I looked them up and lo and behold, not only are these COVID symptoms, these are very prevailing symptoms now that people with COVID have. So this thing, when people say asymptomatic, and I literally had somebody say to me, yeah, I have COVID, but I, you know, I'm doing great. I don't, you know, I don't even have any symptoms. And then like five minutes into the conversation, person said, oh, hold on, I got to go get some medicine. I have a terrible headache. And I was like, that's your COVID. <laughs> that probably is related you know, to COVID. So in addition to those things that we have always been on the lookout for, which, you know, they're not super specific because these symptoms also are the symptoms for other illnesses like flu and cold. But, you know, the, the standard, the fever, the chills, the, 
the body aches, the coughing, the trouble breathing, all of that. Be on the lookout for the more milder things like, you know, fatigue when you exert yourself or the sore throat or the headache, because those are very common um, symptoms now. And it looks like with Omicron, these symptoms are much more uh, prevalent for people and, uh, uh, you know, with the current strains. So you can like point, Dr. Deborah, I had a, a, a colleague of mine say when their daughter, um, the way they found out their daughter, it was a headache. Yeah. And later on, after they had the baby rest a little bit, the headache came back. And so that would prompted them to get tested. So the signs and symptoms, it's almost like we need to list everything that we started off with and then continue to add these. Yeah. And then if I may add, um, when I was at the bedside caring for patients, when patients came in originally with COVID-19 and they came in shortness with shorter breath, like if there was on two liters of oxygen and they started advancing, it was some, it was maybe a couple hours or a time frame so that we could see to be able to es escalate their care. Now what I'm hearing is they may get a headache or they may get a fatigue, and they're going from like zero to a hundred. And just a matter of seconds and minutes and times, you know, I've heard so many people say I didn't feel well on my way home. By the time I made it home, I felt like I was dying or I couldn't get out of the bed. And so, like I agree with what she said, pay attention to those minor signs and symptoms. Please do not ignore. And if I could say anything, please do not be discouraged by the weight. Of the, of the hospitalization or don't be afraid of any of that because like I said, I have heard people go home and then their family can't get a hold of them and then they're coming up, they passed away from COVID because they didn't want to wait. Now, now, now Dr. Deborah, let's get back and want to do a little bit more of this, this, this epi pull out, if you will. Uh, when we talk about the signs and symptoms and we're looking at what's happening people are making their own decision about whether or not they have Delta or Omicron. Can we, can we do that? Can we self-diagnose like that? Or you know, how do you caution us? Well, um, you can, I don't think it'll provide you very much. <laughs> so let me just, <laughs> let me just say this. And I don't know why, I guess because it's new for people to hear about these strains and that they have names, right? And so what it is is, you know, we've got tens of thousands of, of variants out. The, the, the key is any of them that seem to cause more severe symptoms or um, that seems to spread easier, some of them will rise to the level of being labeled a variant of concern. And when they get labeled a variant of concern, we used to talk about where the mutations were occurring, right? Like the P1 variant in Brazil or, you know, the B113, you know, we, we get, we were referring to them more technically, but same way with like, um, um, you know, earthquakes or the um, hurricanes, how they get names alphabetically, you know, from A to Z, and then they come back around. They started naming the variants of concern using the letters of the Greek alphabet. The thing that I will say to people is it almost doesn't really matter which strain of COVID you have. And it really also doesn't matter which strain of COVID is dominant in the community from a prevention perspective, because the same strategies work, whether we're talking about preventing you from contracting Omicron or Delta or Mu or whatever, you know, strain we're talking about. What has been updated a bit is um, some of the finer points. So for example, because Delta, I mean, Omicron, I say is like the sticky, it's stickier, right? It takes far less for you to actually become infected. Um, it seems to replicate a lot faster, far less exposure, you know, and, uh, and people are getting infected. So, so now the importance of the mask has gone up, right? Because it takes less to cause you to be infected. You really need a mask that is gonna provide you the best protection, right? So we've heard the recommendations that people use N95s or if you use are using a cloth mask or a surgical mask that it be layered, right? So if you use a cloth mask that you have a surgical mask underneath of your cloth, cloth mask. The point is the mask still works, right? It just, you know, you maybe have to take it a step further to be a match for the, the sort of strains that are out. So no, people won't really be able to diagnose themselves. 
uh, and they'll be okay. It won't matter if you have Delta or Omicron because your symptoms are going to be what they're going to be and your you know, infection and recovery is going to go how it's going to go. The real key is that people um, don't infect others and that they have access to healthcare should they need it. And that's why the vaccine is so important because it still is doing a very good job at preventing people uh, from getting severe illness and reducing severe illness and hospitalizations and death. So we really need to pay attention to the signs and symptoms. Yes. <laughs> They're very much also mirror the flu and we know we're in flu season. And so we can't make those distinctions on our own. So, so Dr. Wolfer, you as resident pediatrician, you and Dr. Reynolds, you always, the, the babies are just your, your priority. Um, this, this whole notion of more children and even infants, I just got to know earlier that I've got relatives who have babies infants, less than a year, less than two years old, who are now COVID positive. So what, what, what this shift again, we got information early on, babies, children don't get it, they're fine. And now we're seeing this increase in cases with children and even hospitalization. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for raising that really important issue of the children. And so um, we have definitely seen an increase in the number of cases with children. Um, U of M recently put out the fact that the ICU is um, almost completely full uh, with patients. And so this is an issue. Again, if you remember in the beginning of the um, of the pandemic, we talked a lot about flattening the curve, right? Because we just need to not outstrip the capacity of the hospitals. And certainly now, even in pediatrics, we're seeing that that is an issue. So not just on the, in the adult ICUs, but in the pediatric ICUs, we have so many patients and of course, we're all hit with um, not as much of the staffing as we need because people are out sick. Um, and so we all have to do everything that we have discussed to try to flatten that curve. So we need to follow all of the precautions. We need to do our best to keep ourselves from getting COVID, whichever variant so that we don't end up overwhelming um, overwhelming the hospitals. And the one thing that we shouldn't do, one thing that doesn't flatten the curve is not going to the hospital if you're very sick. Mm -hmm. If you are really sick, if you have a, if you need help, you should go. If you are have questions, you should call. And so you should be interfacing with the healthcare system in that way, but we've got to help out our hospitals and our healthcare providers by doing everything we can to keep our kids and ourselves healthy. And that includes vaccinating the kids who are eligible for vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. <laughs> uh, yes, and there's layers of protection. We've talked about the mask. We've talked about physical distancing. We've talked about hand washing. We agree by now that vaccination is the foundation for prevention of complications from COVID, okay? And as Dr. Furholden said, for us to discuss, I think I have Omicron or I think I have Delta is a bunch of nonsense because it takes one to two weeks for those lab results to come back from the people who have the equipment and everything they need to make that determination. That is a determination for a population, okay? So we could say there's, there's less Delta and more Omicron now. However, the things that we must do to care for ourselves and for our families have not changed. And that's why it was so important to start off with the Genesee Health Plan talking about how to get coverage. But we also, those of us who are not vaccinated, we get vaccinated. And who should get vaccinated? Children five through adulthood, okay? Who should get the influenza shot? People six months of age and older. Did you hear me? Six months of age and older. Who, who should get both at the same time if they haven't had one or the other? People five years of age and older can get the influenza vaccine and the COVID vaccine at the same time. Now, we talk about our personal experiences. I have a good family friend, young family, uh, three, three children, two adults. 
one person got sick, one adult got sick. Then the next adult got a positive test. Then one of the children got a positive test. And now there are two other children in the household. Uh, and the grandfather's coming in to provide care. Mm. Now, <laughs> this is great that you have backup. But the question is, we should make sure we're doing everything with all those layers of protection because we really don't want to put seniors like a grandpa like myself in the position of uh, having to care for sick adults and sick family members. Uh, and, and so whatever de decisions we make affect the others around us. Yeah. So and one, one more thing, Okay. <laughs> this week, you know, I follow my own advice. I go to my doctor for a follow-up visit. The office is packed. Some people have on masks, others don't. So this is where I pull out my uh, N95 mask and put it on, and I find a place as distant as possible. The other alternative is when you check in, you ask the person at check-in, can you wait in your car and call me on my cell phone? Mm -hmm. Now, because of my time in that situation, I called my 93-year-old mother. You hear me talk about her every week. And I told her, look, mom, I'm not coming to visit you for the next five days until I can get checked for COVID. And so we have to think and use our heads. And if you don't know, ask somebody. Go to credible sources. And it's not necessarily, you know, uh, cousin Jojo, <laughs> you know, Get a verifiable, credible source. Thank you for letting me go over. So when you talk about credi credi credible and verifiable sources, we have a question from Barbara McGann, one of our uh, consistent viewers. And our question is about packages that come to our doors. You know, we talked about this early on. That we, uh, are, so the question is, do we go back to unmask, uh, uh, excuse me, spraying or waiting to bring unmasked mail packages into our homes in order to avoid being exposed. Or let me say it the way she says this, to put it another way, how long do I need to wait to bring in any mail or package on the general assumption that I may be exposed to COVID? I do not wait. I do wash my hands after I have dealt with the package. I do wash my hands before I eat. I do wash my hands before uh, I go on to do anything else. So hand washing is the key because right now the main problem is it's transmitted by aerosol droplets in the air. And that's the mask so important. But of course, if someone sneezes on your hand or someone has sneezed on the package, hand washing is the most important thing. And that includes wiping down your doorknobs and handles and light switches. Those are the most important things that we can do. Uh, but, you know, I go shopping. You know, I wash my hands as soon as we're done with a grocery shopping trip. Uh, I avoid touching my face. Uh, these are things that we can, these are things that we can do. And, and the most important thing is to Whenever you have a question, wash your hands. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Dr. Wolfer, did I see you have a point on that as well? No, I agree wholeheartedly that washing your hands is the most important thing that you can do. Um, and I would put a lot of my energies into wearing the mask, social, physical distancing, ventilation, all of those things. I think with the packages, um, they told us before that, you know, that is not one of the major ways that um, the virus is spread, but it is important to, to wash your hands just in case um, somebody has, as Dr. Reynolds said, sneezed on it beforehand. I still find myself every now and again wiping down stuff spraying them off I haven't gotten out of that habit but we've been told we don't actually have to do it so so whatever you need to do to make sure you feel comfortable follow those practices Dr. Deborah I've got another epi question <laughs> and then we want to ask one question of, of uh, Katie Baxter about mental health Dr. Deborah question it says so is herd immunity not an outcome to look forward to anymore 
You're on mute, Doc. Yeah, unfortunately, um, <laughs> and we're again, it's a new vir virus new to the human population, right? This strain of, of uh, coronavirus, SARS CoV 2. So I wouldn't say that herd immunity is impossible, it's no longer quite the goal. Um, because in an ideal world, when we talk about immunity, people would actually have immunity. They would be um, um, protected from infection. What we're finding out now is that from the vaccine, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that people might not become infected. They're just much less likely to become very sick. Um, with uh, your own personal protection that you get when you are infected and then recover, it looks like the uh, amount, of, the length of protection that one might have is a little shorter than we have seen with other viruses. So the notion for herd immunity is to have a sufficient, you know, percentage of the herd protected and not at risk for infection. And I just don't think that's going to be exactly what we're going to uh, be able to accomplish here because immunity and protection is going to ebb and flow. Um, so the real goal is to get as many people vaccinated as possible um, for people to be fully vaccinated. And we see that that um, sort of criteria are seem to be evolving, right? It looks like to get the full benefit, you are going to have to get a booster um, shot. looks like without the booster, you're not getting the full benefit um, of the vaccine and that we're going to consistently practice some of the other preventive um, measures to, you know, help reduce spread. But yeah, I think herd immunity is, has gotten complicated and it's no longer like the big game that we're playing. So, so again, we're right back to, to square one. We all need to follow those universal protocols, do what we need to do to stay safe and make some really informed and wise decisions. And so that gets us to one last thing before we, we leave the round table. There's still questions about mental health concerns. So I just wanna ask Katie Baxter from the Genesee Health System, if you could just please give us that number where people can call, but also there's been many questions about mental health concerns and the connected potential connection to autism. I don't know if we can make that claim yet, but that's a question that we're hearing. Okay. First of all, I want to say that um, the number is 810-257-3740. That is our crisis 24-hour number. So um, it's important that everyone has that and utilizes it. This is a very difficult time for everyone. And we have a lot of people in the workforce. There's a lot of staffing shortages. People are ill and um, are moving around in employment. And so it's a difficult time. It's a stressful time for everybody. So we really need to take care of ourselves. And I would say that keep in mind that we're all on the same team, uh, community members, parents, educators, healthcare workers. We all have the same goal of protecting each other and, and taking care of each other. So remember uh, the mental health aspect of ourselves too, while we do our uh, take care of ourselves with our physical safety protocols that we reach out to people, even if it's in virtual ways or take care of each other, allow people grace and, and spread some kindness because that's so important and it's a difficult time and we, we all feel the strain. So yes, I wanted to respond, Yvonne, you mentioned about um, the question was related to autism and tell me that again. Well, autism, is there a connection to autism and COVID? Because it seems like we're seeing even more and more autism cases coming forward. Well, I, I don't know that there's any connection with autism and COVID. What I would say is that um, uh, the, the treatment protocols for individuals who have autism um, applied behavioral analysis is um, a, a clinic-based and home-based uh, service. And it does require um, professionals working in fairly close contact with uh, the, the children, which is a little different than in some other clinical programs. So that uh, could be the safe, uh, the, the, uh, some things that you're hearing. Keep in mind that at our Autism Center at Genesee Health System, we follow all the protocols related to safety. Everyone's required to be masked. They all have screenings when they come in. We do contact tracing and it's monitored very closely if there's any kind of symptoms, signs or symptoms. So we take all, all of those things very seriously 
Um, but sometimes um, providing treatment, uh, we, we are in close contact with, with the children we serve. Thank you so much, Katie. And I wanna remind uh, those of you that are listening, we do have panelists who can answer those questions. So we see Clarence Pierce here from Hamilton Community Health Network. If you have any questions about anything related to the services that they provide, Clarence, we thank you so much for offering your, your, your availability today. So please put those questions in the Q&A. I have one other question. I wanna just make sure I address this because it's in the signs and symptoms area for any of our panelists, especially pediatricians. One of our participants says, I have a seven year old nephew who lives in Texas and is fully vaccinated. He has a rash, raised small bumps, not red, all over his torso. It was, it's not itchy. His mother took him to the pediatrician and she was told that they are seeing this type of rash on children with COVID. He was tested and his test came back positive. His mother was informed that he could, obviously could not go back to school and post, both parents have been tested and they're in isolation. The question is, has this rash or type of rash been seen in Michigan or documented? And what could you tell us about this? What should parents be looking for? Dr. Wolford, is that something you can, can share with us today or do you need to do some investigations and come back and respond to that next week? Sorry, thank you so much, Yvonne. I was ans busy answering one of the questions on um, in the chat. Uh, as far as rashes and COVID, um, there have been rashes associated with COVID, a couple of different kinds. Um, hard to know exactly what this baby's or the seven-year-old's rash looked like, um, but we can certainly do a medical moment on rashes and COVID. In fact, I like that topic. So how about we plan for that for the future? Thank you. And thank you so much, Diane, for giving us that question today. We're going to have to close out our roundtable today. Thank you all for that wonderful input. And please continue to put those questions in the Q&A and our panelists will answer them for you. We want to shift to the health department. We know that they, was, uh, they were closed during the holidays, but they are back up and running. They have been since last week. So Sherelle, please provide us an update from the health department. Good afternoon. It's so great to be back. Um, we are still continuing our efforts of getting uh, individuals in the population vaccinated. I did change the graph for today. This graph, it pretty much shows the breakdown of vaccine coverage by age group in Genesee County. And it was mentioned earlier today that we're seeing an increase of positive cases in children. So if we look at this graph here, we'll see that children five through 11 um, has the smallest amount of uh, coverage as far as the population overall that we have in Genesee County. So we want to make sure that we are thinking heavily about vaccinating our children, especially with the recent uptick in cases and, uh, and other places. Next slide. My internet connection is unstable. Next slide. And I also would like to, yeah, I'd like to point out that we did have a recent change in CDC guidelines for the booster. So now it is recommended for children who are 12 and older who did receive a two-dose two series in the past to get their booster shot. And the time frame is now five months from that two dose series. And then one thing that we didn't talk about or emphasize in the past is the third dose for immunocompromised children. So we wanna make the community aware that if you have children who are immunocompromised, they can receive a third dose 28 days after the two dose series completion. And then five months following that third dose they are eligible for a booster dose as well. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so with that being said, we do have our clinic, clinics that we implement throughout Genesee County. Our standing clinics uh, coming up for next week include Our Lady of Guadalupe on Tuesday, on the 18th from 12 to 2 p.m. We'll have uh, Moderna and Pfizer there, bring the children. We'll have uh, dosing for children as well. 
in Pfizer. And then Wednesday will be at Central Church of the Nazarene from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. with the same vaccines available. And Thursday, Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., which is the evening clinic for those who can't make it to those earlier in the day clinics on Tuesday and uh, Wednesday. You can come out to Shiloh and get your vaccination there. We'll also have, again, Pfizer, Moderna, and the proper dosing for children to receive their vaccines. Next slide. And that brings us to testing. As we all know, so many people have gotten COVID since the holidays. So we want to make sure that you know where to go get tested. And those uh, entities remain the same. You can be tested at Word of Life Church in the community, Bethel United Methodist Church, as well as Macedonia Baptist Church. And you can visit your local Walgreen Hamilton Community Health Network for your local right aid. I also would like to mention that if you are doing a home test, if you purchased the test and have not sought out the community resources, um, Genesee County asks that anyone who tests positive at home, that they report that positive case to our CD department. So uh, you wanna give us a call at 810-257-1017. To report those positive at home tests. You can also email us at gchd cd at gchd.us. And then that email, you will just want to include your name, date of, birth, date of birth, and the date of your test. And the best way to contact you so that we can do some contact tracing and make sure that we have the data to um, update for the county as well as the state as far as positive cases. So Surreal, again, that number for a home test, if they test positive is 810-257-1017? Correct. Now, before we just quickly, uh, for the testing sites that are at the churches, are vaccines still being given at those sites? So if they go to get tested, they can also get vaccinated? Yes, ma'am. So I believe that during the holidays, because of short staffing and shorter uh, work weeks, they might have pulled back on doing vaccines. But to my knowledge, the testing sites at Macedonia, uh, New Bethel, and First Word, I'm sorry, Word of Life churches, they are providing testing and they are providing a uh, vaccine. They have the Pfizer vaccine for adults and children. So you should be able to go there either to get a test and a vaccine or a vaccine. <laughs> okay, all right. So now what about the homebound? We're gonna go there. Um, yes, homebound residents, we ask that um, you do reach out to the health department because we can make sure that you're taken care of whether it's testing or vaccination. So please do give us a call at 810-344-4800. You can also visit our website um, for more information in regards to just how we're doing as a community um, as a whole. You visit our website at gchd.us. We have updated the website. Things are a little different, but there's a breakdown of the spread and how we're navigating through it. Thank you so much, Sherelle. And I also want to just remind our listeners too, at those testing sites, and uh, the lines are pretty long now because a lot of people are wanting to get tested and they're asking you to register, pre-register before you go. So consider that. Um, so that when you get there, you got an appointment and you can get tested, but they are also taking walk-ins. You may have to wait, but uh, they're, they're available to you. So thank you so much, Sherelle, for that update. And I just wanted to mention that there is a link on our website for those different uh, testing centers where you can schedule that appointment. Thank you so much. We want to hear quick from the city of Flint. Lottie, good, good afternoon. We're glad you're here with us today. Can you give us that update from the city? Sure. Just want to let you know that uh, I, I uh, think it has been announced to the public that the um, customer service walk-up window 
um, is open from nine to four um, as the lobby of City Hall remains closed um, temporarily until further notice. Um, fire trucks, if you see them out, we got a couple new fire trucks um, that'll give the fleet uh, uh, new fire trucks and the entire fleet is less than 10 years old. So we've got some fantastic things going on over, over at the fire department. Um, City Council did approve a one-year contract uh, with Ernst & Young. Um, if you're not familiar, then that will uh, be the compliance firm to help us um, um, stay compliant and decide how we are spending the ARPA funds. And so there will be some community engagement sessions planned in the future to help the community uh, tell us, the city, how you'd like to see that money spent. When also, you mean ARPA, what do you mean? Uh, ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act dollars. All right. Thank you. Um, the city of Flint is hiring. Uh, we've got a couple of public health uh, positions that are open, public health navigators. We've got some uh, positions in blight. We've got um, environmental compliance analysts, uh, payroll coordinator, plumbing and mechanical inspectors, police officers, uh, urban designers. There's a lot of really cool jobs available with the city of Flint to help us um, uh, make sure that Flint is, is the best place it can be. So if you're looking for a job or you know someone that's looking, send them over to the city of Flint's website. And then also lastly, um, phase five of the city's incremental water blend to 100% for the secondary water supply uh, will begin on Tuesday, January 18th uh, with phase five construction work at control station two. Um, that'll begin on January the 24th. Um, and then there's some tentative construction happening at control stations two that'll take uh, about a month worth of time. Um, and then the city will be 100% on the GCDC water supply. Um, you can learn more about this and anything related to water at the upcoming Water System Advisory Council meeting, uh, which I believe is scheduled for uh, Tuesday. It's at the Dome City Hall, uh, 530. Okay, and so that's gonna help us uh, with the, the issues regarding our water. So please stay tuned for more information about that. Thank you so much, Lottie. Now we wanna spend the next few minutes talking about our health equity brief. Dr. Deborah Farholden, we missed last week hearing the update. So you're gonna give us two weeks worth of information today. Uh, I know there's a lot that we need to learn about what's going on with our health equity. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, yeah, I will give you the info and I encourage people, if you have not, if you're not signed up for the brief, do sign up. You can go to our website too, fches, F-C-H-E-S dot O-R-G, which is the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions. You click on resources and then all of the briefs are there. If it's your first time ever going to the page, you'll be automatically prompted uh, for the brief, but you can go back and see the, you know, 60 or so. Uh, briefs that we've had in the past. Um, so what we know is, and we've all heard, we're in the surge. Um, this is, some of this is a bit to be expected, right? Because, um, and these are the, the beginnings of the, of the week. So that week there, 95, December 19th was the week that started on uh, December um, 19th. Uh, and you can see the following week, that would be the fallout from Christmas. It says December 26th, but that's for the week that started December 26th. So I'm convinced that we're seeing the combined impact of both what I call the wildfire strain, Omicron, which seems to spread a lot more easily like wildfire, um, and that combined holiday effect. You know, perfect storm, something that spreads much easier and a lot of people um, coming together uh, and potentially infecting one another. So the rates from two weeks ago to now, they doubled last week and they didn't quite double this week, but nearly. Um, so last week we had just over 2,600 cases in uh, Genesee County. And this week we've got almost 4,500 confirmed cases. These are known confirmed. They've tested positive um, cases. And you can see we've got another 842 probable cases. These are people who maybe have not tested, but they are a known contact. They're in the house with somebody who um, tested COVID positive. They have signs and symptoms um, like that. And similarly, um, last week, um, uh, the cases doubled from the week before. And then this week, they went from 705 in the city of Flint to over 1,000 um, cases in the city of Flint. And then when you add in these probable cases, and then next week we'll have added 
what are called lag cases. And those are cases that in fact were positive right now or positive during that week, but their test results haven't come back yet or made it into the database for them to be counted. That's that gray bar there. And we always add that, you know, uh, to that number in the weeks that consistently there are always cases continuing late so it's these are an underestimate right we call the confirmed cases which you get up to the top of that red line um but yeah this is this is what the surge looks like it's predicted that we're going to be in this surge uh well into the beginning of february so we've got yet another couple weeks to go which means Prevention, prevention, prevention. It's important that people do everything they can to prevent themselves and others from becoming um, infected. And I know I keep saying it, but I'm gonna keep saying it to make sure that people are hearing it. That means get your vaccine, get your booster shot, get a well-fitted, uh, high-filtering mask, right? We now figured out one layer ain't enough. You need multiple layers and a, and a um, well-fitting mask. And then the last metric that we talk about is the testing positivity rate. So that's of the people who get tested, what percentage of them come back positive? Earlier on and at the height of the pandemic, uh, early earlier on, we were around 10%. And 10% was high. And now we are close to 40 percent the positivity rate last week was 38.6 percent so that means nearly 40 percent or two in five people who were getting tested were coming back positive that says two things to me one that um a lot of people are getting um um a lot of people are getting tested uh because they have symptoms or they have an exposure but it also means that it's really just running rampant uh in the community so Again, the goal here is prevention. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we do this uh, once a month, typically the first uh, week of the month. Uh, our great team uh, led by Mary Catherine Crawford and our wonderful analyst, Alan Harris and Rick Sadler and his team uh, put this together um, so that we can keep things in perspective um, and geography. So um, in November uh, in Genesee County, we had um, 8,768 uh, confirmed cases. And in December, we had 10,846. So even from November to December, the numbers were trending upwards. That's a 24% um, increase. Flint in November was ranked number 13 out of the, I can't remember if it's 22 or 24 um, uh, municipalities um, within Genesee County. And now they are at number um, uh, 22. Um, so we we moved a little bit uh, in Flint there in the um, in the wrong direction. And as you can see, in most places in the county, if you compare November, which is the yellow line, to December, um, in all but you know a few places, uh, the numbers are substantially higher in December than they were. Um, in November with, with, with about four or five exceptions um, to that. So what, what that basically says is we still do have some variability, but I, I like dispelling the myth that Flint is just so bad off. Flint is a lot bigger population-wise than a lot of the other municipalities. So we can't just look at raw numbers. You've got to look at the rate. You've got to divide the number of cases by the population. Otherwise, the estimate will appear off, right? If you've got 100 people, of course, you'd expect to have more sick people than if you were comparing that to a population of only 10 people. Mm -hmm. So that's why we produce this every month uh, to let people know what the rates look like uh, by municipality. Again, the goal here um, is not to, you know, have, have all, all of the municipalities safe and all of them um, with um, lower rates, but that's where we are. Um, work now. And then I just want to reinforce a couple of messages that we have around Omicron. This is also, um, you can get this in the health equity um, uh, brief. Um, as we know, it looks like it's uh, much more easily um, transmitted and uh, um, 
so we we've just seen this uptick in um um cases uh really in a lot of places we are have now exceeded um case counts from any other peak um that we've had so far it does appear that the um symptoms um, and the um, illness seems to be less severe um, for people, but it, you know, there are still people that are getting really sick and there are still people who are being hospitalized and who are dying. And, and Yvonne, and I know you hear a lot of these stories as well. I've heard stories of people in as little as two to four days um, from when they get really sick you know, um, dying. That is far from trivial. <laughs> far from, um, yeah, far from trivial. So the vaccines still seem to be um, effective, again, at preventing severe symptoms, uh, severe illness and hospitalization and death. Um, but it does look like to get that maximum benefit, you need to be fully vaccinated and get your uh, uh, recommended booster shots. So I'll tell you what my good friend, Dr. Shanina Knighton says. She says, I don't want your COVID, nor your cold, nor your flu, et cetera. And how many times have we heard people say, oh, uh, I, you know, people will sneeze and say, oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sick. Or they'll say, oh, no, it's not COVID. It's just a cold. Well, I don't want your cold either. So if you're sick, stay home. Um, I hope we can learn that during this pandemic, even, you know, it's not just about spreading COVID. We don't want people spreading flu or their cold or other, um, you know, respiratory type illnesses. So if you don't feel good, stay home, uh, wear your mask when you're um, out in um, public. And really it's time, I think, for people to take the reins of their health, you know, and I always give people the three basics, practice good sleep hygiene, right? Get that good sleep at night. Um, move your arms and legs 30 minutes a day and eat the best quality, high nutrient dense diet um, that you can afford. And if you don't have a primary health care provider, get one. <laughs> this yeah. is not the time to be without a primary health care provider. And I'm absolutely encouraging people to stay up on your health screenings. We had way fewer mammograms and colonoscopies and all of these basic primary health care screenings that have been um, in 2020 and even in 2021. Let's not continue that for 2022. Get those basic primary healthcare screenings and make sure that you have a, a primary healthcare provider. If you don't have one, reach out to the local federally qualified health center. For us, that would be our great partners at Hamilton Community Health Network. And if you, insurance is a problem, people should reach out to the Genesee Health Plan. And I keep telling people affordable healthcare is now more affordable than it's ever been. So, yeah, thank utilize you. those resources that we have available. Thank you, Dr. Deborah, because you do remind us that we are continuing to learn lessons. And one of the lessons learned is that things are ever changing. And sometimes mm -hmm. the more they change, the more they say the same. So we've talked about flu for all these years, coughing, sneezing. Now we're talking about COVID, coughing, sneezing. So we really just need to pay attention to our overall health care and, and just not take anything for granted. And so Absolutely. thank you so much for that, Dr. Deborah. Uh, Mary Catherine, um, we want to hear more about your recommendations. Yeah, so thanks. Thanks for um, it's definitely good to be back. There was so much, you know, important information last week. Um, so we just can pack everything in. So I want to get you um, all caught up with some really important pieces of policy uh, relative to your health and well being. So um, the first thing I want you to know about <clears throat> is a new federal law that took effect on January 1st, and it is named the No Surprises Billing Act. And um, aptly named because it prohibits surprise billing when you go into um, the emergency department um, and receive care from a provider who is not in network with your insurance. And this is so important because it prevents these astronomically high and unexpected bills. Um, and not only is it just for when you go to an emergency department, it extends to certain ambulance services and also to non-emergency services as well. Um, so this is just a, um, another really component piece of this um, policy is that it also requires uh, healthcare providers to disclose and obtain consent from patients 
who must waive any uh, billing protections before a provider can actually legally bill them who is not in their network. So this is just a really, really important protection for patients, especially as we know how, um, how the time that we're in where medical services is, are so high in demand. Um, so the second thing I want to bring up today is actions from the Biden administration to address the crisis our hospitals and our patients and the public are facing. Um, I think we've we've certainly heard uh, people attest to this throughout today in the webinar um, when it comes to weights and 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 testing availability. <clears throat> So in response, uh, the Biden administration is deploying additional medical personnel to hospitals um, that are facing some of the worst burden um, and extreme burden from COVID. And so this includes military doctors, nurses, and other personnel, including um, that are coming to, to hospitals in Michigan. And it also includes expanding hospital capacity by directing FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to activate more staffing and resources to hospitals. Um, so while these are focused on federal sponsors, I'm gonna segue into some of the state actions that are going into play um, this month. So on the next slide, so as early as tomorrow, over a million uh, Michigan residents are gonna see some extra funds on their bridge cards uh, to help put food on the table through January and February. Um, I do want to point out that even though this is is state, this is actually a result of the of the federal act, uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This, this is going to help actually like over seven hundred thousand um, households in Michigan between now and the end of January twenty fourth. Um, so the funds are going to appear automatically on people's bridge cards who are eligible to to receive the extra funds. And um, just some more additional welcomed news. Uh, Michigan received its first supply of new COVID medications about one week ago. Um, so there are two drugs authorized for emergency use by the FDA. And what's super important right now is because there's uh, you know, a limited supply of these new drugs, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has actually established a tiered you know, eligibility criteria um, with prescribing requirements for providers. So just the first tier, individuals of any age who have moderate to severe um, immunocompromised uh, you know, systems fall into the first tier of eligibility, and that's regardless of vaccine status. And then the preceding tiers are based on age and then other um, risk factors that were established when uh, the vaccine was in limited supply. And so this includes obesity, chronic respiratory disease, uh, pregnancy, diabetes, um, and even cardiovascular disease. So this is really gonna help ensure that the, distribu the distribution of these medications is, is equitable um, and that they go to patients who need them most. Thank you, Mary Catherine. Just, just to emphasize for all of you, the community health workers and all of you that are working in our communities with families, with a bridge card, they may know it, but if they're not aware, please encourage them to pay close attention and utilize those resources to help them ensure that their families have the meals that they need. So thank you so much, Mary Catherine. I appreciate what you share with us for the policy brief. So we wanna encourage you, if you have not been receiving the policy brief, here's how we can, here's how you can do that. There is a information that tells you how to subscribe to the health equity, health equity brief. Dr. Deborah mentioned it earlier, but you can go to the Flint Center of Health Equity Solutions website, www.flintcenter.org, and it will give you all the information about how to sign up, as well as connect you to the previous policy briefs. We also want to remind our community health workers and our social workers that credits are available for you, and we appreciate you signing up for those credits every week, and we want to Make sure that you do that. For those of you that are, are new or even you're talking to people and they want to be a part of the webinar, I had an individual we worked with last week to get a part of the web, um, join the webinar, they can go to hfrcc.org and it will show them how to register. We're working, getting near to uh, week 100, almost two years now in this conversation. There's more for us to learn. So we want to invite you to help us in, engage others to be a part of the webinar series. And again, as I mentioned, community health workers and social workers, because of your request, we now have contact hours for social workers, continuing education units for our community health workers. Please be sure that you identify which one of those that you're applying for 
and you will get your continuing education units and your social work credits. Today has been a tremendous day. Again, it is January 14th. We wanna appreciate you for joining us today, but we wanna even grow our audience. Um, since we're doing this, we wanna make sure that everyone has an opportunity to learn more. Like us on Facebook, help us get the word out, www.facebook.com backslash HFRCC or subscribe to the YouTube channel at Healthy Flint. We continue to encourage you to send us your questions via email at info at hfrcc.org. And you've done that, so we were able to respond to those. Or give us a call at 810-835-2130. And as always, we look forward to seeing you next week. I say always because it's been a good little while now. Thank you for joining us for the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center's 96th session of the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you again for joining us.